morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. My name is Sue Schreiber, and I will serve as your liturgist today. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship God with the passion and joy of King David and all the people who sang and danced before the Ark of the Covenant. Though our voices must be silenced for a season, our hearts cry out with joy before the Lord. Gathered in person and across the miles, we join together as a community of faith. May God receive and bless the words of our mouths, the joys of our hearts, and the worship we offer God alone. Christ cause us to be holy and blameless. The riches of God's grace promise forgiveness of our trespasses. Let us confess our sins. Holy, holy, holy Lord, you are the God of glory. We confess that we often forget that your holiness is dangerous. We take our impurities for granted, make excuses for the sins we commit, and expect you to overlook the harm we cause while still demanding justice from others. We do not deserve your mercy. Forgive us and return us to a right relationship with you for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. You made us for the purpose of praising you, 
Enlighten us with the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill our calling in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. According to the riches of his grace, which God has lavished upon us and sealed for us by the promised Holy Spirit, hear this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Take a moment, kind of spin around in your seats a bit, give a wave to those nearby. And we can say good morning to our friends at home by giving them a wave up here. If you are here in the sanctuary, we invite you to take those yellow pads and let us know of your presence. And one of the things that we would like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we're moving back into what we remember as normal, and today the tower doors were open so you can come and go as you would like through the building. But before too long, we'll be needing our ushers and greeters back. So if that is something you would like to do on occasion, maybe once a month, if you would let us know that on the yellow slip, we will be in touch with you about doing that good work as well. Uh, but the number one question I'm often asked about worship is, when will we be able to sing again? We will begin to sing again on the last Sunday of this month. So you will be able to sing with your mask on and not with your Metropolitan Opera voice, kind of sustained a little bit. So uh, there's another thing you can look forward to as we get back into a more normal feeling pattern together. You'll notice in the bulletin that on the final Sunday of this month, the 25th, we will have our church picnic at Wesselman Woods. We will be providing, that is the church, fried chicken and paper products. Uh, you can bring a side dish and whatever you would like to drink. Whatever is a very broad category. So you take that as you would like it to be. There is no judgment. Uh, just make sure you can get home. Um, this Wednesday, we will celebrate Patty Swanson's 80th birthday. And the flowers back here are given especially in her honor. And uh, Patty is going to be watching this service uh, this afternoon with Nancy Irwin. And we're going to let Robert kick loose with a little happy birthday music for Patty. So, Robert, if you please. this Wednesday. We hope that you will have an experience of worship this morning. Let's continue with our worship of God. As we open the pages of scripture this morning, let us open ourselves to the Spirit's leading and heed the Spirit's prompting. Spirit of the living God, seal in us your word of truth, the gospel of salvation, so that we can faithfully follow and joyfully serve our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. 
The psalm for the day is Psalm 24. It is the song of the pilgrims who are going up to Jerusalem. Let us read the psalm responsibly. The earth, is the, it, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all that who dwell therein. For it is the Lord who founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord and who can stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood, nor sworn by what is a fraud. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek the Lord, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the glorious sovereign shall come in. Who is this sovereign? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the glorious sovereign shall come in. And who is this glorious sovereign? The Lord, the Lord of hosts, is the glorious sovereign.
Thank you, Ian. So, we left the David story last week with David going into the city of Jebus, the last Canaanite stronghold, and eliminating the Canaanites from the land. And since none of the tribes of Israel had owned that land, he could legitimately call it the city of David, which would become Jerusalem, the city of peace. So, this week, David does something even more astounding. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God and Ohio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres, with harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Odem Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. Glory be to God who gives us the word. May God write that word on our hearts, and may God and God alone receive glory, honor, and praise. The story is told of a woman who went to a very high steeple church as a visitor one more Sunday morning. She was escorted to a pew by an usher wearing formal morning wear. As the service moved on, the woman began to get happy, as they say in some Christian traditions. The usher approached her and asked her to refrain from outburst. But she said she would try, but of course a few minutes later the woman was back on her feet shouting, Amen! Well, once again, the usher approached her and asked her to sit down and remain quiet. She did the very best she could, but she could not contain her joy. Again, the usher approached her and said, Madam, we do not do that here. Please sit down and be quiet. The woman answered, but I've got religion. I've got religion. And the usher responded, well, Madam, you did not get it here. In the 1970s and early 80s, the charismatic movement was a force in the religious world. Members of mainline churches became involved. A church I was serving as director of Christian education had a small group of members that were involved in the movement, and they began raising their hands in worship. It nearly destroyed the church and resulted in the pastor, who was also a part of the movement, leaving the church under somewhat suspicious conditions. There's a lot more to the story. But the crowning blow was what was considered the inappropriate behavior of those in worship. There are a lot of rules about worship. Now some of them are written down in the Book of Order in the Directory for Worship. Some rules are established by local church sessions, but a lot of the rules are unwritten. They grow out of local traditions. 
During the Apostles' Creed, some congregations descend into hell and some don't. During communion, some congregations hold the elements to take them all together at the same time, while others take the elements as they are served. Some congregations sing an amen at the end of a hymn, and others don't. There are unwritten rules about who sits where. These are the most dangerous of the unwritten rules and can lead to fisticuffs in the aisles when pursued with too much vigor. There are unwritten rules about all kinds of things in worship, but the thing is everyone is supposed to know them and abide by them. King David is going to help us think about worship over the next few weeks. David has rid the land of the last holdouts of the Canaanites. He's conquered the Jebusite city of Jebus, renaming it the city of David. He has consolidated his power and established his government. But now David goes a step further and brings the long-forgotten Ark of the Covenant back to the city. The Ark has always been a mysterious and enigmatic piece of history. Without it, Indiana Jones doesn't get a start to his film franchise. But let's remember what it was. The ark was built according to God's instruction, and according to God's instruction, Moses placed the two tablets of the Ten Commandments inside. The ark was placed in the tabernacle as the people of Israel journeyed across the Jordan into the land that would become Israel. And then the ark is basically ignored and unmentioned until the time of Samuel, whose call to God's service was heard in the temple in Shiloh, where the ark of God was. And for the people, the ark of the covenant was the place where God was present with the people. Not in a figurative sense, but in a literal sense. Atop the ark were two cherubim, angelic beings, and God lived in the space between them, enthroned on the cherubim. Moses spoke of hearing God's voice coming from between the two cherubim. So the ark was the very presence of God among the people. David brings the ark back into public prominence. In two grand processions, the ark is carried into the new city of David. God's presence is, once again, in the center of the people's life. In the first procession, David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. In the second procession, we are told, though, when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, David sacrificed an ox and a fat one. And then we are told, David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the shofar. There has always been a question about David's appearance in the procession. The phrase linen ephod has been interpreted over the years as David prancing around in his tidy whities like Tom Cruise. Well, that would be reason for David's wife, Michal, to despise her, him in her heart. But upon closer examination, David was dressed in a linen ephod, which is a robe worn by the priests. Perhaps that was the reason David's wife, Michal, despised him in her heart. But it is far more likely that the reason Michal was so upset is that David was behaving in a wildly unkinglike manner. Monarchs do not dance wildly in public. When was the last time you saw Elizabeth II do a Charleston? And a king should not be dancing wildly in the presence of the Lord. Your majesty, we do not do that here. But I'm in God's presence. I've got religion. Well, your majesty, you did not get it here. Still, 
Whenever we are consciously aware of the presence of God, how do we respond? Whenever and wherever we become aware of God's presence, how do we react? Some might fall on their knees or on their faces in silent adoration. Some might sing at the top of their lungs. Some might weep. Some might laugh. The simple truth is that there is no one single way to react to the presence of God. For David, the reaction was to dance wildly, which opened the door for another 30,000 people to dance wildly. We would feel rather inhibited to dance wildly before the Lord, especially if we'd been a Presbyterian for 20 minutes or more. And since worship is a celebration of the presence of God, there's no one single way of worshiping. Some say you can only worship with a pipe organ. Nonsense. Some say you can only worship with a band. Rubbish. Some say you can only worship with large screens. Claptrap. Some say you can only worship with stained glass windows. Poppycock. Some say you can only worship when led by a male pastor. Balderdash. Some say you can only worship in English. Twaddle. Some say you can only worship on Sundays. Hogwash. When someone tells you that there is only one way to worship, there's a very high probability of them telling you how they like to worship and seeking to make it normative. And there is the great danger. What is worshipful for me might not be worshipful for you. Which means that we must always strive to respect each other. God's presence may move you in a particular way and move someone else in a different way. But know this, the presence of God always brings love for each other and peace. What is proper worship etiquette? It begins by calling us to open ourselves to the presence of God. It means, and this can be challenging for cerebral Presbyterians, it means opening our hearts, our emotions, our feelings to God. If that prompts joy, laughter is lovely. If it prompts sadness or grief, tears are appropriate. By the way, I cannot tell you how many times over the course of my entire ministry, when I'm greeting people on the way out the door, I have been apologized to because someone cried in church. Tears are our natural baptism. And they are appropriate always. If the presence of God inspires us to, to choose a different way of living, there can be a time to commit ourselves to that new way, which is why we allow some silence after the sermon for you to do what you might need to do. What is proper worship etiquette? It continues and means giving those who worship with us the space and the permission to have their own experience of God's presence without the threat or fear of our judgment. It means allowing them the same freedom we ourselves have. It means being thankful that God is speaking to them just as God is speaking to us. What is proper worship etiquette? It means shutting down our monkey minds that keep reminding us of all those things we need to do. What laundry needs to be done, where we're going for lunch, what we'll fix for dinner, what we need from the store, and all the rest. It means quieting our distractive thoughts and concentrating on this very moment. It means allowing ourselves the freedom and the privilege of focusing on God and God alone. A couple of generations back, proper worship etiquette meant more about what you wore to worship, hats and gloves for the ladies and girls, shirts, ties, and jackets for the gentlemen and young boys. How you sat in worship, 
upright, never turning around. How you did, or more often did not, interact with other worshipers. It meant little diversity of any kind. One Sunday morning looked and sounded pretty much like every other Sunday morning. But now, proper worship etiquette means having and giving the freedom to experience God's presence and responding to it. Let none of us be a mechal and judge the experience of another as inauthentic or insincere. Let us celebrate the glory and wonder of God, however we are inspired to, for now and evermore. Amen. As God's people called to celebrate the goodness of our God, let us stand as we are able and affirm our faith and calling. The church responds to the message of reconciliation in praise and prayer. In that response, it commits itself afresh to its mission, experiences a deepening of faith and obedience, and bears open testimony to the gospel. Adoration of God is acknowledgement of the Creator by the creation. Confession of sin is admission of every person's guilt before our God and of their need for God's forgiveness. Thanksgiving is rejoicing in God's goodness to all people and in giving for the needs of others. Petitions and intercessions are addressed to God for the continuation of divine goodness, the healing of human ills, and deliverance from every form of the arts, especially music and architecture, contribute to the praise and prayer of the Christian congregation when they help people to look beyond themselves to God and to the world which is the object of God's love. Please be seated. Consider what God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Remember that even now the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Rejoice that we are part of God's plan for all time. Let us present our offerings of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Glorious God, you created us because you are love. It is your will and our destiny that we live into the full humanity of Jesus Christ so that we can praise you, give voice to creation's joy, and join with all things in heaven and on earth to rejoice in your goodness forever. Thank you for this high calling and privilege. We bring an offering taken from the gifts you have given us. Because they come from you, they are holy. Because you have given them to us, you honor us as if we are holy. As we return them to you with our thanksgiving, bless them with the power of your love so that they may touch the lives of others and inspire them to join us in giving you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Amen. Please keep in your prayers Ethel, who is recovering from surgery, Gerald, who is recovering from hip replacement surgery, Lisa, who continues treatments in chemotherapy, Patty, who is dealing with health challenges, Gail, who is readjusting to life after rehab for a broken hip, Peggy, who is dealing with an illness. Please pray for those who are grieving, depressed, or anxious and for all our friends and members who live alone or in residential care facilities. Are there other prayers of thanksgiving or prayers of concern you here in the sanctuary would like to include? Jack. Our friend Amy, dealing with the potential loss of her husband. Tracy.
Grateful for a new niece born on Friday morning. Yes? For Glenn, who's battling leukemia. I just say it is so good to see so many of you in this room. I think this is the highest attendance we've had since we've reopened the building. And I appreciate you being here. Um, it is a lonely place when you're not there. And uh, it's been a lonely place for too long, so I'm glad you're feeling comfortable enough to come back and join us. Thank you very much. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you have set a plumb line from the foundation of the world to lead us to truth. Receive our prayers of hope and healing on behalf of the church and the world. Give wisdom to all leaders and people to resist the earthly powers of fear and violence that destroy our common life. In the face of injustice, oppression, and brutal power, Strengthen our wavering wills to stand in the power of Christ. Stir up in us the power to care for your creation, not as resources to be exploited, but as a precious gift to be held in trust as a revelation of your faithfulness. Inspire your church to share Christ's love beyond the safety of its walls and fill us with an infectious joy for sharing your gospel as we welcome your coming reign. Bring healing and wholeness to all who are haunted by broken relationships, abuse, illness, or terror, or trauma of any kind. Restore us in your peace. Eternal God in Christ, you gather all things up in heaven and on earth, and fold those who will be born this day and those who will die into the joy of your never-ending realm of peace. For our hope is set on Christ as we live to praise his glory. We remember those of our congregation whose entrance into eternal life we mark in the days of this week. We remember John Meeks, Kay Chapman, Steve Sampson. As their lives blessed us with example and service, may their memories continue to bless us until we join them in your eternal realm. And now, gracious God, Hear the prayers we offer you from the silence of our hearts. These and all of our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, God with us, who still teaches his disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
One Sunday, the minister picked a little-known hymn as the last hymn of the morning. Ministers do that sometimes. On the way out, as he was greeting at the door, one of the members of the congregation came up and said, Reverend, I didn't like that last hymn. To which the minister responded, well, it wasn't for you. Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher and theologian, coined the phrase, the theater of worship. Now what happens is we get to be thinking that you're the audience and I'm the ringmaster and Robert's the musician and you're here to watch what we do. That's not it at all. The audience for worship is God. And we're all in this together. We are the great company of actors that are doing something for God. It is our common work in Greek, liturgia, from which we get the word liturgy. Our common work is as the community of faith to express that God alone is worthy. We are expressing God's worthiness, which is also the root of worship. So go, and even when we are not within these walls, when we are not together, Go and express the glory of God as you experience it every day. And if that experience should lead someone else to believe, praise God. So go and take with you the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.